Hi, welcome to our segment on Pablo Picasso. In this video, we're going to be looking at his work as well as his development of the movement of Cubism, which he um, co-founded with another artist named Brock, whose work we're going to be looking at as well. So we're going to look at some early Picasso first, and this is a self-portrait he did in 1901. Um, this is during his so-called Blue Period, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But first I want to read a quote um, from Picasso. Um, he said, When I was a child, my mother said to me, If you become a soldier, you'll be a general. If you become a monk, you will end up as the Pope. Pablo Picasso told his mistress, Francis Gillot. Instead, he added, I became a painter and wound up as a Picasso. And so I really think this quote really gives us some insight into, you know, his identity as an artist. And he really was considered uh, an artistic genius and, and really the father of, of modern art um, today. For half a century, Picasso led the forces of artistic innovation, shocking the world by introducing a new style and then moving on as soon as his unorthodox became acceptable. His most significant contribution, aided by Brock, was inventing Cubism, the major revolution of 20th century art. Before we look at that movement, we are going to be looking at some of the early work of Pablo Picasso, in particular his Blue Period, and then we're going to um, move into um, his Rose Period. All right, so let's go back to this first self-portrait. Picasso arrived in Paris just before turning 20, and his beginnings in the French capital were not easy. He was alone, he had economic difficulties, um, and he wandered um, through this, you know, huge metropolitan area. He was immersed in this sort of bohemian atmosphere of the city, and it was probably extremely overwhelming for him. Um, there were lots of prostitutes, alcoholics, tramps, and Picasso began to depict the world in which he was living, creating um, these very melancholic, or, you know, that's another term for sad images that had these sort of blue tones um, filled with these kind of ghost-like pale figures. And so this was the beginning of his so-called blue period. Um, these works were inspired by um, Spain um, and were painted in Barcelona and Paris and are now some of his most popular works, um, although he had quite a bit of difficulty in selling them at the time, mainly because they were these depictions of poverty and, and sadness and loneliness. So it was hard to find an audience who wanted to purchase them. So um, this period starting point is uncertain. Um, it may have begun in Spain in the spring of 1901, or it may have started in Paris in the second half of the year. Um, but again, a lot of his images depicted, you know, prostitutes, beggars, um, and drunks um, were frequent subjects. Okay. Um, so here we're looking at another image from the Blue Period, the old guitarist. This is another popular image um, by Pablo Picasso from this time period. And so again, I think you can sort of see that these images are, you know, he has these very solitary figures that dominate um, these compositions um, from his, his Blue paintings. So the viewer is confronted with these themes of loneliness, poverty, and despair um, that really do pervade and sort of come up as a, a motif in his work. So we're going to move into his later period known as the Rose Period. Um, this represents an important um, point in his life um, and the work uh, that he was um, creating at the time. Um, it had a great impact on the development of modern art. So we really start to see this beginning of perhaps um, cubism, um, definitely when we see these sort of um, geometric forms on the, the, you know, this the clothing of the Harlequin being depicted. And so this period began in 1904. Um, Picasso had settled in Montemare, um, which was a, a sort of city where bohemian poets um, and writers lived in France. And um, again, you know, it's a little bit different. So instead of depicting these themes of poverty, loneliness, and despair, and these somber tones of 
daunting blues, we see this sort of, these kind of orange and pink um, tonal colors that he's incorporating. And so Picasso's Rose Period represents more pleasant themes of clowns, harlequins, carnival performers, depicted in these very cheerful, vivid hues of red, orange, and pink, and earth tones. These paintings as well are, are really based a lot on intuition and emotion rather than from direct observation, as we've seen from other artists from different um, movements, you know, post-impressionism um, and expressionism. And the Rose Period really marks the beginning of the artist's stylistic experimentation with primitivism. And again, this, this sort of fascination that artists had with um, what they called primitive um, works of art from non-Western countries like Africa. And Picasso had quite a, a collection of, of African um, artifacts and masks, um, and, and we see that, um, we'll see that in, in some of his future work. And, uh, you know, in addition, he collected pre-Roman Iberian sculpture, oceanic and African art. And so this led to Picasso's, um, what they term his African period in 1907. And this really culminated into this sort of um, proto, you know, pre-Cubist masterpiece that we have been talking about in class. Les Demoiselles de Evian. So let me bring that up really quickly. So this is the image that we've been talking about and looking back. So I think it, looking, you know, and writing about in your journal responses. So I think it is important for you to understand um, his early work and then how he arrived to this because it is so different um, and, and varied. And, you know, some people look at this and think, oh, Picasso, because, you know, he's being expressionistic and abstract in his style that he, he couldn't paint or, or, you know, draw anatomically correct figures. Well, he could. He was extremely talented and, and could draw and paint in a natural and realistic manner, but he chose not to. We're going to look at one more um, painting from the early Picasso period during his um, Rose period. And so this is known as the family of Sultan Banks um, from 1905. And again, this is considered one of his masterpieces of his Rose period. And, and sometimes the Rose period is referred to as his circus period, um, where he depicted these sort of um, carnival people and circus performers. From the late 1904 to the beginning of 1906, Picasso's work centered on single theme, a single theme, the Salton Bank, or this sort of um, circus performer. Um, the theme of the circus and the circus performer had a long tradition in art and literature and had become especially prominent in the French art of the late 19th century. A more immediate inspiration for Picasso came from performances of um, the, circ the circus Medrano, um, a circus that the artist attended frequently near his residence and studio in Montmartre. Um, circus performers were regarded as social outsiders, poor but independent. As such, they provided a telling symbol for the alienation of avant-garde artists such as Picasso. Indeed, it has been suggested that the family of Sultan Banks, and I know I'm not saying that right, serves as an autobiographical statement a covert group portrait of Picasso and his circle. So again, even though the colors are a little bit more um, happy or positive in terms of pinks and, and reds, um, there is still this theme. And then obviously the circus is meant to be this kind of um, magical form of entertainment where people are, you know, being entertained. Um, but there is a sort of isolation and loneliness, I think, that these circles this, these circus performers um, experience and feel, and they're also transitory as well, you know, going from town to town, so they aren't really able to make connections, you know, outside of, of their circus troupe, and I think that was very attractive to Picasso. Um, he reworked this composition several times, adding figures and altering the composition. Um, the figures occupy what appears to be this desolate landscape, and although Picasso has knitted them or sort of put them together in close proximity um, in a careful balanced composition, each figure psychologically is isolated from the other and from the viewers. So how, he, how has Picasso done that? So I want you to take a moment and look at this. So in proximity and physical, you know, nearness to each other, they are connected, except for this figure over here. 
Um, but psychologically, how do they seem disconnected? Well, I think perhaps, you know, no one's looking at anybody. They're all sort of glancing away. Um, and they're definitely not looking at the viewer. You know, this girl's looking off the frame. You know, these two boys are looking off the frame. This man is looking, you know, off the frame here. This man is looking here, but again, no one is looking at each other, and they're definitely not making eye contact with the viewer. Um, so in his Rose or Circus period, Picasso moved away from the extreme um, pathos of his earlier Blue period, the sort of, you know, somber loneliness. But, um, you know, in this composition uh, that of family of Salt and Banks, um, he, you know, he still has this mood of introspection and sad contemplation. So, but it's more of his, um, his sadness and his individual, um, you know, struggle as opposed to sort of depicting these, you know, you know, in his blue period, you know, prostitutes or old, you know, these beggars and drunks, you know, this is more of a, a psychological representation of how he was feeling inside. Here's an example of the painting and, the, and to give you a sense of the scale of it. So he, you know, he did do these large scale paintings. Um, and, you know, this painting was removed from the Spanish Salon at um, the ninth biennial, biennial of Venice in 1910 um, because it was considered inappropriate um, by the organization because of maybe these, the depiction of these sort of circus performers and, and this idea of these these people being marginalized and outside of society and um and again this sort of um this this idea of alienation and isolation all right so we're going to get to his masterpiece les demoiselles de avion and this really marked a radical break from traditional composition and perspective and painting. Now, he's not the first artist we've seen do that. Um, hopefully, when you look at his work, you'll see, um, you know, some similarities with Cezanne, um, with Kirchner. Um, and, you know, definitely there were, you know, Matisse, you know, playing around with this idea of perspective and, and really moving away from this idea of this sort of traditional um, high Renaissance composition. So when we look at the image, it depicts what appears to be five naked women with figures composed of flat, splintered planes. Um, some of you describe the figures as you know, rectilinear, and you know they, they definitely are geometric in some form, but I think planes um, is a good term that you could use and incorporate into your vocabulary. So definitely when we look at these faces, um, they're not idealized, and they are... Um, inspired by the Iberian sculpture and African masks that Picasso did collect. Um, when we look further into the composition, we see that the figures inhabit what appears to be this very compressed space where um, these kind of shapes sort of project forward. You have these sort of jagged shards, um, and, and it is. It's, and I think someone, I can't remember, I think it was Megan, who described this as very violent, you know, these, you know, these lines and these, you know, sharp, um, triangular shapes, um, even, you know, even the space they inhabit is very jagged, um, and, and looks, you know, very disturbing and violent, I think. Even this still life in the foreground looks, looks crazy. I mean, look at this melon. I mean, it, I wouldn't want to pick that up. So everything about this is, is, is done in this, um, very, you know, splintered way. And, and it does, it almost seems like these women inhabit like this, these shards of glass or these shards of glass are behind them. Here it looks like she's pushing back a curtain. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, definitely a lot of interesting things going on. So definitely, I think when we look at this, well, and we are going to look at some of Picasso's later work um, and his um, invention of cubism, you really do see the beginnings of, and that push towards, um, towards that um, movement. You know, here the composition is very fragmented, um, and, you know, and he was really creating a lot of work um, similar to this at the time. Picasso unveiled this um, painting in his Paris studio after the months after months of revision. Um, the Avion of um, the work's title is a reference to a street in Barcelona 
um, famed for its brothel. In Picasso's preparatory studies for the work, the figures at the left, um, at the left was a man, and we heard Sasha point that out, but the artist eliminated this anecdotal detail in the final painting. So I'm going to show you, and here, here's another picture. This is actually located at the MoMA um, in the Museum of Art there. I've seen it several times, and it really is amazing to look at in person. So we also see in this painting this, um, this adaption of primitivism. We see the abandonment of perspective in favor of flat two-dimensional, these sort of a two-dimensional picture plane where you have these geometric shapes or planes. And Picasso makes a radical departure again from this European, this traditional European style of painting. And so this is really referred to as a, a proto, and proto means, you know, before or pre. Um, we talked about that. Remember, we looked at the pre or proto Renaissance, you know, the you know before the Renaissance, but the the beginnings or the foreshadowing of the Renaissance. So this is this is something. This is similar. This is foreshadowing this um, this later work that Picasso became very well known for. Um, it's being shadowed in this painting. So this proto Cubist work is widely considered to be an important. Um, stage and his early development of, of both Cubism and, and really influenced um, modern art and painting. Les Demoiselles was even revolutionary and controversial, um, you know, even amongst his closest associates and friends. Um, Matisse considered the work to be something of a bad joke, and we'll see that Matisse, and we, we did talk about that, how him and Picasso had a rivalry, rivalry between them. Um, Brock, too, initially disliked the painting, yet perhaps more than anyone else, studied the work in great detail, and effectively um, he developed a friendship with Picasso, and later um, they would collaborate, and this would lead to um, this Cubist revolution. At the time of its first exhibition in 1916, the painting was deemed immoral. It's not surprising. Um, the, the work painted in the studio of Picasso at Les Batu Les Var was seen publicly for the first time at the Salon des Antines in July 1960, an exhibition organized by a poet, André Salmon. It was at this exhibition that André Salmon, who had already mentioned the painting in 1912 under the title Les Bordets Philosophiques, gave the work its present title, Les Demoiselles de Evian. In preference to the titles origi originally chosen by Picasso, Les Bordels de Evian, to lessen the scandal and impact of the public. So Bordel means, or Les Bordel means the brothel. Um, Picasso, who had always referred to this painting as Mon Bordel, or My Brothel, or Les Bordels de Evian, and Picasso really preferred that name and wasn't really happy with with the name that Salmon ended up giving the painting. So again, Les Demoiselles de Evian is one of the most important works um, in the creation of modern art. Um, the painting de again depicts five naked prostitutes in a brothel, two of them pushed aside curtains around the space where the other women strike very seductive and erotic poses. But their figures are composed of flat, splintered planes rather than rounded volume. And that's, you know, something I think when we looked at some of these other depictions of the nude female, Titian in particular, the Venus of Urbino, you know, these sort of rolling mounds of flesh and these, you know, very voluptuous figures. You know, again, these are figures that, you know, you don't want to touch. They don't seem very sensual. Um, in, in the same respect um, of Titian's work. Um, and their eyes, you know, are disturbing. They look lopsided and, and, you know, and they're sort of staring at us, in particular this one. They're asymmetrical. Um, and the two women on the right have threatening masks for heads. So here, you know, they, they look a bit more human. Here, they definitely look like they're, they have these masks on. And, and they're, they're horrifying and terrifying to look at. Um, the space, too, which should recede, comes forward, again, like these jagged shards of broken glass. Um, and, and again, we talked about the still life, um, you know, with these sort of jagged melon slices. That would be hard to eat. 
Um, the faces of the figures at the right are influenced by African masks, which um, Picasso um, assumed had functioned as magical protectors against dangerous spirits. This work, he said later, was his first um, exorcism painting. A specific danger he had in mind was life-threatening sexual disease, a source of considerable anxiety in Paris at the time. You know, you know, we, this is, you know, before antibiotics and, you know, syphilis and, you know, all sorts of venereal diseases that are treatable today um, could be life-threatening if, if one encountered those during the early 19, I mean, the, during the early earliest, ugh, early 20th century. Um, and so, you know, spending time in brothels, you were, you know, sort of taking a chance at um, getting sick or getting some sort of venereal disease. And so, I, you know, some art historians think that um, this is, you know, the fact that he's depicting these women this way, and especially these two with the African mask, it's sort of depicting his anxiety or, or that fear of, um, of getting a um, sexually transmitted disease. I'm going to show you some preparatory sketches. I showed you this in class, and so this was a version, and in this one he included men, or what appear to be sailors, um, and then in a later sketch he, you know, got rid of the sailors and sort of got rid of that narrative and just um, focused on um, the poses of the women. And here's a comparison to one of these sort of earlier, sort of um, traditional European depictions of the female nude. And you can see he's referencing that pose. I mean, this was a, a common sort of pose that a lot of artists incorporated. Um, so he's he's incorporated that sort of sensual pose, but then the way he's um, expressed the figure is is very different. So, you know, here we see him abandoning a single point of view. So when we look at this, um, he's really working with these um, fractured multiple viewpoints on a two-dimensional surface. Um, for instance, we see with this figure her breast, but also it, what appears to be her back as well. Um, so you're, you know, the way we talked about Cezanne, you know, he did those still lifes um, where he sort of seemed to be sort of composing these multiple viewpoints into one composition. Um, definitely Picasso is doing something similar. Um, and also some references to think about too, you know, we talked about um, neoclassicism and romantic art and we talked about Angres and the Odalesque. Um, and this idea of the exotic and the other, you know, he depicted the harem girl from the East. And Picasso, I think, was fascinated by primitive art because of this notion of the exotic or the other. Um, and he really thought of primitive art as being more authentic in expression, simpler um, and, and sort of, you know, devoid of any of these sort of um, loaded um, ideas associated with um, urbanization and modernization and, um, you know, that it was more of a, a natural way of being, I, I suppose. Very similar to Paul Go Gauguin and, and he, you know, him sort of looking for this salvation by going to Tahiti and trying to escape Europe, I think. But again, going back to this point, um, the masks are definitely meant to be um, disturbing and again sort of reference this fear of um, contracting um, a venereal disease which he did have a friend die from. So I wanted to discuss the rivalry between Matisse and Picasso and, and hopefully we can go back and make some connections there. So at a salon in 1905 um, Henry Matisse um, received a lot of notoriety and attention and remember he um, had started this group called Les Fauves, Les Fauves group. Um, this, this term or this name was um, given by a critic named Louis Voxelis, um, and he described um, the work of these Fauve painters as Donatello chase la Fauves, so Donatello among the wild beasts. Um, and so, you know, again, in these paintings that Matisse had, had done were, you know, they were also exhibited with these Renaissance type sculptures uh, that were also in the room. And so that's how the name came to be. 
But Matisse, you know, really did achieve notoriety um, and really became the leader of that movement, um, this modern movement of Fauvism, where they had these very discordant colors and unusual color combinations and really bright, vivid tonal ranges. Um, he really continued to build this um, movement from 1906 to 1907. Um, and Matisse did attract artists, including um, George Brock, who um, Picasso would later work with to um, create um, Cuba, Cuba's, Cubist work. Um, Picasso's work had passed through his blue period at this time and his rose period. And while he had a considerable follow following, his reputation um, was tamed in comparison to his rival Matisse. Um, to make matters worse, Matisse shocked the French public again in 1907 at uh, another independent exhibition when he exhibited the painting Blue Nude, which you see depicted below on the right-hand corner. Um, and this Blue Nude was one of the paintings that would later create an international sensation at the Armory Show of 1913 in New York City. And we'll, we'll talk about that as well later. And so in reaction to Matisse, Picasso painted um, Les Demoiselles de Evian. And, and it, it really was to sort of, you know, combat him and, and sort of say, hey, you know, I'm the new father of modern painting. And um, so he really was vying with Matisse, Matisse for this um, position um, as this sort of leader of modern painting. And upon its completion, um, the shock and the impact of the painting propelled Picasso um, into the center of controversy and really knocked Matisse and the Fauvism movement off the map and, and really virtually ended the movement by the following year. So in our next segment, we're going to be looking at the wor work of George Brock. Um, and, you know, George Brock had seen Picasso's Les Demoiselles de Evian. Um, he wasn't sure he liked it at first, but he definitely studied it and took the time to look at it. And, you know, together him and Picasso ended up um, creating this idea of cubism um, and really changed the face of, of modern painting. So stay tuned for part two. Also, there is a wonderful video um, that I'm going to post from the Khan Academy website um, about Picasso's um, um, Les Demoiselles d'Evian, so check it out.